welcome everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'd also like to send out a special thank you to our friends at NCSE, who, by the way, is celebrating their 40th year of supporting science teachers for helping NABT host the second annual Darwin Day event. We look forward to sharing this special encore presentation of the Evolution Symposium presented at the NABT conference in Atlanta. So again, welcome. Um, we're very excited to be hosting this event. Before we begin, I want to um, respectfully acknowledge that I live and work within a territorial or traditional territory of the Seneca um, Indian tribe, who along with the Cuyahoga, Ottawa, and Wyandotte came to be known as the Ohio Seneca Cuyahoga. This area around me, around the Sandusky River, supported many indigenous people who were forcibly removed from their ancestral lands in 1830 and resettled in Oklahoma. And so um, as we look to work to build our knowledge and community, I encourage you to reflect upon and honor the contributions of the indigenous people in your own areas. So um, thank you for letting me uh, share that land acknowledgement. So a couple of housekeeping items. Um, closed captioning is available during this presentation. A recording of the talk will be made available at the end of the month. And um, the order is that Dr. Um, Dr. Stanley will speak, Rebecca Brewer will speak, and then there'll be questions at the end. So that's kind of the general um, layout of this webinar. So let's talk about Dr. Stanley a little bit, Dr. Ed Stanley. Um, Dr. Ed Stanley earned his PhD from the Richard Gilder Graduate School um, with his PhD in comparative biology. Um, he studied at Villanova University. Um, we're here in his master's in evolutionary relationships within the family um, Cordelidae, which I hopefully I pronounced properly. I, I apologize, yeah. Dr. Stanley. <laughs> um, also studied the University of St. Andrews. So again, we're very honored to have Dr. Ed Stanley here. Just a little bit more about Dr. Stanley. He has, is the associate scientist and director of the Digital Discovery and Dissemination 3D Lab at Florida Museum of Natural History, where he works with colleagues to investigate and explain diversity, evolution, and natural history of wide range of organisms, including reptiles and amphibians. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stanley. I'm going to turn it over to him and uh, thank you again for joining us. All right. Thanks so much, Chris. Can you, everyone hear me okay? That's all fine. My microphone's turned on. Good. All right. So, um, hi, yes, no, I, I, um, I live and work at the, uh, the, the Florida Museum of Natural History. Well, I don't live here, but you know, it feels like it sometimes. Um, and uh, for the closed captioning, you may have noticed that I'm, I'm not actually from around here. Um, so if the words are mispronounced uh, in, the, in the transcript, I'm sorry about that. Okay, so yes, yeah, so the Florida Museum is actually a, 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 an amazing place and, and natural history museums all over the world are, are remarkable places. Uh, I think when most people think about natural history museums, they think about um, the public facing side where um, visitors will come and learn about uh, you know, sort of educational entertainment, learning about the, the world around you. Um, our museum gets about 200,000 visitors annually um, and they will wander around uh, eight exhibit halls, including fossils and local fauna and uh, native peoples and things. Um, but behind the scenes, there are actually um, lots and lots of science, lots and lots of science going on. Uh, so we have 55 um, faculty uh, curators and collections managers that oversee and operate um, a, a collection of uh, 40 million specimens. And they're distributed across 17 different collections, including anthropology, uh, biology, things like mammalogy, ornithology, you know, so on and so forth, and paleontological things, botany, vertebrates, invertebrates, all kinds of wonderful things. And it's always, always growing. This So we have thousands of millions, uh, tens of millions of, exhibit, uh, of specimens, including things in jars, pinned butterfly specimens, pressed, um, pressed uh, uh, botanical sheets, skeletons, um, skins, et cetera, et cetera. And this acts as really as a, as a, as a biological library and a history of life on our planet that we can, we can go and, and use and researchers and educators like yourselves can, can come and make use of. And so my job as the, as the head of the digitization um, uh, lab is really uh, to turn um, these, these um, physical forms that sit behind the scenes in collections um, into these digital forms that we can put up online and, and people can share and, and, and incorporate into their research and educational and, you know, and, and if you're just interested in printing a, a giant uh, black wildebeest skull, you can, you can do that now. So although my background is in herpetology and I, and I study lizards uh, like these, these fellows here, um, being part of this, this, this lab and, and heading up this lab has, has led me to do all kinds of fun stuff, including now I find myself doing different things every day. So fossil frogs and developmental series of 
uh, geckos and, and other um, embryological samples. And, and, and more and more these days, I'm getting into invertebrates, uh, CT scanning invertebrates, which allow us to see very, very, um, um, very, very uh, small things like these teeny tiny um, bird lice in giant, uh, amazing detail. As part of our uh, ongoing um, commitment to uh, um, digitizing and sharing this information in, in our collections, uh, I am uh, um, uh, one of the, the, the um, uh, investigators in this large NSF grant that um, is funded by, um, by the, uh, the National Science Foundation to, um, to help us digitize uh, one of every vertebrate genus in, in North American collections, and then also do these amazing soft tissue scans where we can see the, the hearts and the lungs and other things of museum specimens. Um, and we're, we're, it's a five-year project and we're, and we're getting on with it. Uh, we're, we're a long way along, and I'll talk about that more at the, the, the back of this. But we're making all this data freely available. So all of the things that I'm showing today should be available online uh, for you to download and 3D print, and I think we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Another part of the project is to create um, these teaching resources. And, and again, I'll, I'll follow up that on the back. But the, 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 the best part about this job is that I get to, to work with amazing animals, um, amazing museum specimens, and, and really, um, you know, really just get to play around with the diversity of life, uh, including, and not my, not my real original background, snakes. I just, snakes are just fascinating. And I, and I think it's such a wonderful thing to, to, to get back in and study, study snakes again. Um, Here's, here's a couple of different snakes. This is the, um, so the largest and the smallest snakes, and we can digitize both of these things. So this is um, a, a Burmese python that was collected in, in the Everglades. And then this is a tiny little thread snake. You see it easily fits on the surface of a, of a quarter. So, so snakes are really uh, amazing animals. And I think, they, I think they, they create this visceral reaction in people, right? People, you know, either a few people really love snakes and a lot of people really hate snakes, but they're just, they're very polarizing, but people feel feelings about snakes. And I think that then people are fascinated by snakes. And it's not just us modern people today. If you go, you know, uh, go back and, and look at uh, mythologies across the world, you know, snakes take up a huge amount of real estate in the human psyche. Uh, you know, the Southeast Asian, this is a uh, Naja, the, uh, the, the multi-headed snake deity from, uh, from uh, say, from Southeast Asia. And then of course, uh, Medusa, the seven headed Gorgon from Greek mythology. Uh, the um, the Norse uh, Norse religions uh, uh, and, and mythologies have this uh, this the world serpent Jormungandr to uh, that encapsulates and wraps around the world and I think Thor fights it a few times at least once on the other side of the planet you have Quetzalcoatl the uh, the 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 uh, feather feathered flying snake uh, god of the of the Mesoamericans and then closer to home for some of us um, the uh, Judah Christian uh, creation uh, origin story. Um, has uh, uh, has a, a snake uh, dead center in the in the in the middle of that. So so they, they you know everywhere you go there's there's snakes in in mythology and you know to the modern era there's there's plenty and plenty of snakes on display in in modern um, mythologies and and, and 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 films and other places. Right, the symbology of snakes is everywhere you look from the um, from the well this is actually a, a caduceus but uh, but the rod of Asclepius which is a symbol for um, uh, for uh, medicine. Um, to the uh, slightly uh, ambitious uh, bad guys, some would say, of the Harry Potter films. Obviously, uh, Indiana Jones, not a huge fan of snakes. Uh, and I, I guess Mowgli was kind of a fan of snakes here, but not, not in the end, I guess. But so, so culturally and, 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 and at a kind of a visceral level, snakes are interesting. But why are snakes interesting to us as scientists and evolutionary biologists especially? Well, there's a whole reason, a whole bunch of reasons why snakes are really fun to study. First of all, they're really diverse in terms of the number of species that are snakes. So snakes belong to this group, the squamates, uh, which include lizards and, um, and worm lizards and other things like that. Um, so if you look at the, the snakes, there's, a, the snakes, there's about 11,000 species and a full, over one third of them are made up of, uh, of, of snakes. So nearly 4,000 species of snakes. And just that's, that's basically two thirds of all mammal diversity in the world ever anywhere, right? So there's, there's two thirds as many species of snakes as there are all of mammals. So they're really diverse. They also move, they're, they're everywhere. They're, they're fairly ubiquitous, right? With the exception of the Atlantic and, and kind of the, 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 the polar regions and a few islands here and there, they really are found everywhere and they're fairly common where, they, where they're found. They also occupy a huge range of different ecological uh, habitats. So from the, the um, 
uh, pelagic or, or open ocean swimming uh, sea snakes to vine snakes that live up in jungles to this uh, desert um, swimming specialists that you find in every literally every desert on earth and then you know I think most of the snakes that we're probably familiar with are you know more kind of, uh, sort of foresty uh, foresty snakes like this uh, well, that's a water snake I guess um, they're also just packed full of really cool evolutionary adaptations right from the spitting cobras here um, to just the way they get around in general, right? Being limbless. I mean, this is this is a, one of the most beautiful snakes of all. This is a kaboon viper um, uh, from Central Africa. And they have this amazing, well, they can have this amazing way of just walking in a straight line, right? They contract their, uh, their, their ventral scales and just, just waddle in a straight line. You see, it looks like, it looks like a caterpillar or something, right? It's strange. Um, so that's a way, weird way of getting around, but not nearly as weird as the paradise tree snake that flies. They're flying snakes. So this is one, well, gliding snakes, falling with style. Um, these, these snakes will uh, flatten themselves out to basically a ribbon and then can glide across tree canopies from Southeast Asia. They get, they get across um, and can glide from canopy to canopy. And, you know, they live in the same habitats as these, these um, gliding uh, lizards. So they get around. Um, and then all kinds of really amazing uh, threat displays, you think about rattlesnakes rattling their tail, and, and this guy here, which is a horn viper from Iran, which I don't know if you can see that on your screen, but they have this very, very strange tail. It looks like a kind of a weird flower or something like that, but actually what this is, is a lure. So they'll use this, and this BBC documentary shows this, uh, they use this and they can actually um, use this as a lure. It looks like a spider when they wiggle it back and forth. I know, you thought it was creepy enough talking about snakes, and now we're talking bringing spiders into the mix too. But they'll use this as a lure, and they'll sit in a frack and then wiggle a tail around it. When, when a bird will come to eat the, the, the spider, the, the snake will tag it and eat it. So they, they, they tend to specialize on migratory birds. So snakes are weird, right? They're just, just, just a grab bag of super weird adaptations. Obviously, they don't have any legs, and that's, I think, the first thing you think about when you think about snakes, right? You know, uh, describe something as being snaky, you think long, thin, no legs, right? That, that, they're, they're synonymous with being legless. Uh, but they also have a bunch of other weird things, like they don't have eyelids. They have this kind of unblinking stare. Um, they have venom, or a lot of them have venom and venom delivery systems and fangs and crazy hypodermic needle-like fangs, including things that can spray spray um, venom a long distance. Um, they have forked tongues so they can smell in stereo. They, they have an amazing ability to track their prey using these, these forked tongues. And I, I just pause for a second to say, if you haven't seen it, I absolutely cannot recommend enough seeing the um, True Facts video about lizard tongues and snake tongues um, on YouTube. It's Excellent. Very, very one of the best, one of the best uh, funny documentary. I don't know if it's appropriate for everyone's kids, but it's 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 very, very funny and very, very well done. Um, they have flexible skulls, right? So snakes famous you know, they dislocate their jaw, but actually when you see them do this, they dislocate their whole head, right? They can they can they have a very reduced uh, skull that, 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 that is very, very flexible. And they have this all these wonderful warning systems. So evolutionary violence is like, wow, look at these crazy, like this crazy grand bag of amazing traits. You know, how do they get this way? And this is a bit of a cop out, right? So as an evolutionary biology, uh, as an evolutionary biologist, we, we're thinking, well, how do they get this way? The, the first thing we have to do is think, well, where did they start from? What, we know what they look like now, we know what the diversity is now. What did they, what did they start out from? And so I said snakes are weird, but it gets weirder because snakes aren't just weird, they're weird lizards. So if you look at, um, uh, snakes in the context of that, that bigger group, squamates, um, if you draw a, a family tree or a, or a phylogeny, a, a evolutionary relatedness uh, diagram here, you'll see that snakes up here are more closely related to things like chameleons and varanids or monitor lizards than they are to um, uh, wall lizards and skinks and, and plated lizards and geckos, right? So, so that means that that chameleons and, and other lizardy things, uh, varanids and things, are more closely related to snakes than they are to other lizards, which means that snakes are a kind of lizard. They're just a very derived kind of lizard. And if you think about all of these things look lizardy, and so presumably the ants, working this out, the ancestors all probably were lizardy. Um, and so the, uh, the origin of snakiness happened somewhere on this branch. So the ancestors of snakes were lizards as well. So at some point they went from looking like a lizard to a snake and are gathering all of these amazing different adaptations. So how do snakes evolve all these weird um, features? How do they go from a lizardy thing to a snake-like thing? And then I think equally interesting, how do they go from a, a, a snaky thing to all these other different kinds of snaky things? 
there's a huge amount of diversity. In fact, as you say, as I pointed out earlier, there's there's one third of all the diversity of this fam of this group is 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 snakes, and 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 so they radiated and diversified a lot more than all the other lizards did. When you think about them being weird lizards, a lot of things start dro dropping into 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 place, and and you can start seeing that actually all of the strange adaptations that snakes have show up in other parts of the lizard tree, just not all in one place like they do with snakes. So look at no eyelids of snakes, right? Well, there are lots of lizards that don't have eyelids. They have a like a, a clear scale over their eyes, like geckos. Oh, that's a slightly upsetting image, but um, the, the, they have these 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 clear brills, and they um, and so so geckos have that. Or almost all geckos have no eyelids, um, and um, and things like night lizards also no eyelids. All right. Well, they've got venom and a venom delivery system. Okay. Well, so do Gila monsters, which is another radiation of lizards. Unlike snakes that have their venom on their top lip and their fangs on their top jaw, Gila monsters have the venom glands on the lower jaw and the and the and the and the venom delivery fangs on the on the lower jaw too. So obviously convergent or parallel, I guess. Um, but you know they also have a venom delivery system. All right. Well, forked tongues. That's a fairly snaky thing. But of course, so do monster lizards. And in that previous picture of the Heloderma, you'll see that both uh, both of those uh, groups have forked tongues as well. Um, presumably, also the let them the smell and taste in stereo. Okay, well, they have a flexible skull and they can swallow larger preys in the head, but then there's lots and lots of geckos that do that as well. So this is a, this is a legless gecko, actually looks very snaky. This is a legless gecko that allows, that has an amazing kinetic skull that allows uh, it to basically wrap its head around um, its very slippery, uh, skinky prey and, and get a post. This is kind of like a pair of like a ratcheting plier or something like that, needle nose pliers, amazing animals. And then, of course, warning systems, but that's not necessarily specific to, to snakes. Of course, lots of animals have amazing warning systems. But I think the thing, going back to the, the leg thing, I think that's the thing that most people associate with snakes. And so that's the thing that we'll focus on today. But just wanted to point out that you could do this kind of work, and people do this kind of work, with all these other different things as well. So the, the leg thing is interesting because there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, interest in that. Um, but the venom, the forked tongue, the flexible skull, the eyelid thing, that's all, that's all, you know, interesting evolutionary stories that could be, could be uh, dealt with in the same way as that we're about to talk about now. So it's, you know, it's like, a, I feel like Rud Rudyard Kipling here and uh, telling these justo stories about, about um, how the snake lost its legs. But, but, but essentially we're, we're using um, a, a combination of uh, different um, uh, evidence-based um, uh, approaches to, to try and work out the best, the best jump for that. So um, I think there's two main schools of, of thinking um, about, about how snakes probably got from being a legged, limbed form, lizardy thing to being a, 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 a snaky, skinny, leg, legless thing. The swimming hypothesis, which posits much like the transition from, um, from uh, terrestrial environments to marine environments in Wales, um, the, the ancestors of uh, snakes were probably terrestrial and then uh, lived in a, in a um, by the, by marine environments and became more and more um, marine and aquatic and uh, adapted to uh, adapted to the um, to the ocean life and became attenuate, long and thin, and lost their limbs just like whales did, um, and and um, became um, long and thin and snaky like that. And there are actually um, intermediate fossils that you know that would support this in the form of these giant um, uh, marine uh, um, marine uh, mosasaurs and tylosaurs, these large uh, um, uh, predatory um, marine marine lizards that, um, that that swam around the ocean in the Jurassic and Cretaceous around the time that we are expecting to see these things evolve. The second um, second uh, um, hypothesis is that they were burrowing. So you had a this is one of my, I took this picture in a zoo in in Pune in India. Uh, it was the most yeah so the most Rudyard Kipling thing ever. You have a lizard evolution happens. You have a snake. And so the idea is that, that these lizards um, were living underground and then if they were burrowing, they, they'd want to be more attenuate, more long and thin, and the legs would get in the way. And you see this happen in a lot of burrowing lizards today. Um, you have limblessness evolve, and then they come up off ground and diversify from there. So you might say, well, okay, um, what is it that snakes do better? What do modern snakes do better? Do they burrow better or swim better? And of course, the trouble is that snakes are so diverse now, there's so many different kinds of snakes and, and the species of snakes that actually Snakes do both. They, they swim in the ocean really, really well, the ones that are adapted to that, and then they burrow underground really, really well. They're the ones that are adapted to that. And, and then the vast majority of snakes don't do either of those things. 
right? The vast majority of them are climbing trees or, 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 or go around the undergrowth and, 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 you know, up mountains using their creepy tails to catch birds, all kinds of things, right? So it's very difficult to pin that down. Unfortunately, we can't hop in a time machine and travel back 170 million years to observe the transformation from being a lizard to being um, a snake, but we can use a combination of fossils and fossilized remains, and we can use, uh, so paleontology, we can use context clues uh, from extinct, uh, from extant or living species, so, so looking at what the morphology and the ecology uh, of, uh, of living species, um, and, then, and then we can use phylogenetics or evolutionary relatedness to make these hypotheses that, that, of, as what was the driver of snake evolution. So first things first, we need to work out roughly, well, it would be helpful if we're looking at fossils to know what period of, uh, of, of history we should be looking for the fossils that are, that are, um, that, that are the tr transitional forms. So here's our tree again, um, and we can use a molecular systematics, so sequencing DNA and assigning a particular molecular clock. So assuming that mutations happen at a relatively regular rate, we can count up the number of mutations and say, well, okay, X number of mutations per million years, and there's this many mutations, it's the, the difference between these things is, 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 is this point, right? So we, we, we have a, a rough estimate that, that um, and this could be wildly off um, in either direction, of course, this, this relies on, 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 on calibrations and, and, um, and um, clock-like genes. But assuming this is correct, we're looking around the mid-Jurassic, uh, 170 million years ago, for the common ancestor between snakes and their close, closest lizard uh, relatives. Okay, so you might think, well, okay, that gives them 170 million years to get snaky, right? That's, that's, that's plenty of time. But of course, snakes uh, are you know, very diverse and they have a lot of different um, species in them. And they radiate, they started radiating. Uh, all of the diversity of snakes can be encapsulated by these two, two things here. You've got a rattlesnake and a lepidotyphlops, a worm snake, I guess, thread snake. Um, but that that, um, uh, that that radiation happened around 120 million years ago. So, so we really only have about a 50 million year old, uh, 50 million year window for, to go from being lizardy, entirely lizardy, to being presumably what the answer of this was, these two things are, which was uh, somewhat snaky. So this is really the sweet spot that we need to be looking for fossil wise, right? Somewhere between 170 and 120 million years ago. If we look at this, um, um, fossils from around the world, and I, again, this is a great website if you if you haven't looked at it and if you're interested in fossils, it's a great, you can type in, you know, whatever animal you want and it shows where all the fossils are from and the periods you get. So lots and lots of snake fossils around, but if you look at the um, late Cretaceous, uh, sorry, the early Cretaceous and, and mid to late Jurassic, there's much, many, much, much fewer of them. Um, and of course, the trouble with uh, paleontology is that it's not just finding fully articulated dinosaur bones, you know, dinosaur skeletons in the desert. They're, they're often very, very fragmentary, right? And the earliest uh, snake fossils that we know of, um, a lot of from Europe and some from Colorado, um, in, the, in, the, in the mid to late Jurassic, when this transition was happening, uh, you know, known from one or two pieces, right? And there might be more snake fossils out there, but they're just not snaky enough right now to be identifiable to, you know, to being a snake, right? Or they might be, you know, too fragmentary to identify as even being a lizard. So, uh, you know, even this, even this. Um, so these are all these are all. Um, uh, I think maxilla or, or dentary. So the the top or the bottom jaw here, um, and you can see that some of them have teeth. So you probably could work out that they were you know, sort of carnivorous at this point with the recurved teeth. But the oldest one, 160 million, 167 million year old one, which is right in that sweet spot of uh, the the you know, the, the transition, but doesn't even have any teeth. So it's, it's much, much harder to, um, to say. Uh, we have to go a long way into the future to, um, to find articulated fossils. So, so skeletons that, that have the, the skeleton all in one piece. There's a, there was recently described a, um, a neonate or a, a hatchling snake uh, from, from amber from about a hundred million years ago. There was um, a hind limb, a hind, hind body only and no legs on this one. Um, but um, but around that around the kind of the time that we're we're closest to the time that we're we're interested in looking, there's two major um, really interesting um, interesting fossils. There's uh, Nagash, which is um, which is um, about uh, ninety million years old, uh, ninety million years old, and you see it actually has a pelvis and some little legs here. Um, and then this uh, this this thing from um, from um, uh, Brazil, uh, which is tetrapodophus, which literally means four-legged snake, um, which is 120 million years old. 
Um, and so, um, you know, but of course, even by, even by now, you've got that long snaky body, right? So they haven't lost their legs, but they've already become attenuated and the, and the limbs are shot. So they're all well on their way to being snaky. So, um, and, and, and the context clues around, around what these things are doing is, is not nearly enough. So let's go back to the case for swimming. So the case for swimming uh, is, is, I think, um, uh, championed by, by this group, uh, mostly Mike, Mike, well, not mostly Michael, even Cole, uh, Michael Caldwell, but the, these are two people who are, who are very, uh, who are very uh, strongly advocate for this. So the idea is that, that there are intermediate forms between a, a lizard and a snake, and those are the marine um, mosasaurs and their, and their close allies, right? So if you look at a bunch of different um, characters in the, in the skull of uh, snakes, and uh, they, these, these mosasaurs basically look like a cross between a, um, a monitor lizard, like a Komodo dragon, and a snake. So uh, one example is the lower jaw. So this is a lizardy jaw here. Um, and then this is a snaky jaw here. And then this is a mosasaur jaw. And I know it just looks like three triangles on the screen, but this, this hinge here, this, 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 this hinge that mosasaurs have is actually shown, shows up in, in snake jaws as well. And so make that argument that actually these, you know, these, these are the transitional forms, it's the missing link, if you will, and that's, and that's what, what did it. Uh, however, if you think about these hinges, um, this is actually a functional um, thing. So this is a joint, right, that allows the snake to swallow large prey, which is what the snakes are famous for doing. Um, and it might have been that mosasaurs are also um, have an evolutionary pressure to, on them to, to swallow large prey, right? So, so having that hinge in the jaw might not necessarily be um, um, a shared trait that, uh, that they've evolved, um, the, the evidence that snakes evolved from mosasaurs, but it might be convergence and they evolved from two different places to the same thing. All right, um, so we can look at this. So the fossils are suggestive, but not necessarily a smoking gun. But if we switch to this, uh, this com comparative ecomorphology or look at using context clues um, about limblessness in other lizards, um, that um, that might be helpful, right? And there's a lot of se separate origins of limblessness across squamates, um, but there's few marine squamates, outside, few marine lizards in general outside of uh, sea snakes and marine iguanas, but marine iguanas are not limbless. Um, the, uh, and we know that sea snakes are secondarily marine, right? They, 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 they were living on the land and they've gone back to the ocean. So, so it's very hard to, to see a transitional form into a swimming, uh, into a, into a, um, a marine form in snakes, but we have a nice proxy for that. So here's four different lizards. These are not snakes, these are all lizards. These are all like long, thin, attenuate lizards. Um, and these, uh, and there's lots and lots of different origins of, 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 of limblessness in, in lizards, as I said before. Um, but these come in two different flavors. There's sw swimming forms. You see, this is a swimming form and a swimming form and burrowing forms, and this is the burrowing form. And when I say swimming, I mean that they're grass swims. They swim through vegetation, so they, they don't swim through, um, through water, but they will, they will swim in, um, in, in, in vegetation and, and, and use their bodies like, like they were swimming in water. The burrowing forms uh, burrow underground like a, like a worm, just like this. this is a worm lizard. It looks exactly like a worm. Okay, so they look very long and thin and, and similar uh, from, the, from the outside. But on the inside, they're actually very made up much, uh, quite different. So the swimming forms, these are both the swimming, this is a swimming lizard and this is the burrowing lizard. The swimming forms, I've colorized the, the, the torso here in blue and the tail in red. And see that the tail is, makes up the vast majority of the, the length of the, of the body, or the length of the entire animal in the swimming forms, whereas the burrowing forms do it the other way around. They have a very long torso and a very short tail. And I know what everybody asks at this point, it's like, how do you know I'm a snake? When the when the when the when the trunk stops and the and the and the and the tail ends, and of course the answer is you look for its butt. I mean, they don't have a butt; they have a they have a vent that, that they expel waste from, and that's where the tail that's where the legs would be if they uh, if they have. Them. Okay, all right. So that's that's the, the cloaca, and actually the the way we usually measure lizards in general is called the SVL, the snout to venter length. So it's it's really the, the tip of the nose to the uh, to where the uh, where the uh, cloaca is. Okay, so um, so okay, well that that would be a, a useful thing to know how snakes look compared to these swimming forms, swimming forms or barring forms, right? Do snakes have a swimming um, swimmer's body, um, which uh, which uh, with a long uh, tail and relatively short trunk, or do they have a long trunk and a short tail? Well, all snakes that we can that we've looked at, all snakes that I know of, have a relatively short tail and a long body, which is evidence of them being 
borrow, right? If they all have that, then seemingly, presumably their ancestors had that and they were had a, a borrowing form as well. This can be, we can check this. Um, so that's that's one line of evidence for the borrowing forms. Uh, for the comparative ecomorphology uh, or the comparative morphology side of things, we can, and, and, the, and, the, and the phylogenetic tree, we can, we can look at shape as well, the shape of the skull and look at how it changes over the course of the tree. So this is a kind of complicated slide, but essentially, it's a really nice, um, uh, we, can take, we can take landmarks or points on the same point on different skulls here and then measure, get a, get a two-dimensional or yeah, two-dimensional uh, area um, that represents different shapes of, of skulls or bones or whatever we want. So you can think about it. It could be square up here and round down here and long and, th and, and thin down here and short and fat down here, right? These, these are just areas on the tree that, that, that particular shapes will occupy. And we can put those, we can code those, uh, those skulls and put them into that thing. And then we can look and see what the ancestors would have looked like based on the, based on modeling of that, of that tree. So all these little lines here, all these dots here are, um, are individual species of lizards and, and, and snakes. And all of these lines are the, are the evolution relationships behind them. So when we look at um, lizards and the ancestor of all lizards, um, the, uh, which is number one here, they, that ancestor falls inside that, that, um, that area of morphospace space that was lizardy. If we look at the ancestor of all snakes and mosasaurs, those are the big swimming uh, marine things, they also fall in that, in that lizardy, in that lizardy area. But if we look at the ancestor of all snakes, including these borrowing forms, the ancestor number three here, falls inside this new area that is close, uh, that, is, is, that looks like in the, same, in the same area of morphospace space as burrowing snakes. So it suggests that the ancestor of snakes here was burrowing. And then interestingly enough, all other snakes don't reoccupy the lizardy part of the tree, but go into an entirely new uh, area of morphospace space all the way over here. So, so when snakes, if they were burrowing and they came back on land, they didn't just return to where they, where they were uh, at first, they, they, diversified into all these different environments. It's very, very cool. So I know it's a complicated slide. Um, we can also look at other things, other parts of the skull. So if you're looking at the inner ears, another paper, just to illustrate the point that, um, that you have, um, uh, the, these are the semicircular canals, the, the, the negative space inside the, inside the skull here, um, and aquatic forms have these kind of long uh, loops uh, that help with balance. Um, Generalist forms have a kind of a similar sort of thing, and then the burrowing forms are very strange, kind of fat, round-looking thing. If we look at uh, the uh, the ancestor of all snakes, falls out here, and then we also have a number of fossils that retain this uh, this 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 uh, feature, and they look very much like burrowing snakes. So the fossil skulls that we do have, uh, this is from 88 million years ago. This this fossil, but and you know obviously well on the way to being a snake, but we know that they were burrowing burrowing snakes um, 88 million years ago. So Paul goes to suggest that the, 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 um, the borrowing uh, of, of snakes, the, the, the reduction in limbs acted as this kind of evolutionary squeeze, right? So you had a species of, a, species of, uh, of a generalist uh, lizard that went underground, became a specialist living in, um, living in a specialized borrowing habitat and then came up above ground and then diversified like crazy. And that's very unusual. Most times when things get specialized, it makes it very hard for them to adapt to new, right? They, they, they do one thing very, very well, but, but adapting to new environments and radiating out from those is quite difficult. So how did snakes go from a single specialized form to a very generalized, generalist um, diverse group? Uh, well, like most Cenozoic stories, it starts with um, uh, a, an asteroid smashing into the Yucatan Peninsula and wiping out most uh, life on the planet. Um, so this is, this is the, the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous that wiped out the dinosaurs and a lot of other things as well. If you look at sna snakes and lizards at this time, we have records of, um, of, of uh, fossils before and after the Cretaceous uh, Paleogene extinction. So 65 million years, 60, 66 million years ago. Um, we have this, this red line here, right? So these are all the relationships of, and, 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 and the dark bars here, if you can see them are presence of fossils before the paleo, uh, before the, the the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction, and then and then if they if they get onto this side, they uh, they exist, uh, they they survive. The thing, right, so you see that most of these polyglyphantodonts, in fact, all polyglyphantodont lizards, which is just an extinct form of lizards, got wiped out at the end of the Cretaceous. Skinks, most skinks got wiped out. There's one or two lineages that get through. Xenosaurs and anguids also get through. But then you know um, there are also um, 
at least one, um, one uh, genus of, of snakes that uh, found fossils before and after the Cretaceous extinction. So we know that snakes get through the Cretaceous extinction and the molecular side of things, so that's the fossils, the molecular side of things, we can again use our molecular clock. And here's our Cretaceous extinction here. And we, we can see that while most of the lineage is diversified after the Cretaceous extinction, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe six or seven lineages that were that 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 were around that diverse that split from each other before the Cretaceous uh, uh, Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, the asteroid hit, um, and persisted through that. So molecularly and 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 uh, with the with the fossils, it suggests that snakes, some snakes survived the survived the extinction event. Um, and then afterwards, you can see a lot of diversification here and radiations here, suggesting that they probably, you know, did all right once they if, once you made it through the uh, once you made it through the, uh, the the extinction event, you could um, you could adapt and and and, and do pretty well. And this is this is um, uh, followed up by um, looking at uh, the the um, diversity of, uh, of prey choice and prey types uh, before and after the Cretaceous extinction. So this is just looking using modern species as a proxy for for um, uh, these these radiations, but you see prior to the Cretaceous um, the, 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 the the late the, the Cretaceous extinction here, um, the ancestors of all modern snakes were predominantly eating things like termites, and um, and some were eating uh, um, lizards and things. But afterwards, you have these massive radiation into eating all kinds of other um, things like uh, you know snail specialists, earthworm specialists. Uh, Snakes that eat eggs and frogs and all kinds of wonderful things, and this happened after this after this radiation, right? Uh, after this extinction event. So it seems like the, um, the 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 Cretaceous extinction event was actually in the long run relatively good for snakes, right? There, that's a re that's the reason why there are you know um, nearly four thousand species of snakes and not four thousand species of worm lizards. The snakes happened to be around and had a clear clear um, plate to um, to 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 move into or to clear areas to move into. Um, after the Cretaceous extinction, which is very, very cool, right? So you have this, this, this story here where you have a generalist thing going to a specialist and then, and then surviving, uh, 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 you know, essentially being underground during the, this, this amazing Holocaust that wipes out almost all diversity on the planet. Chances are these things are eating things like termites and other things like that, that were able to survive underground, um, you know, during the essentially nuclear winter. Um, and then when they came back uh, up on above ground, they were able to spe uh, diversify into all these different amazing forms that we see today. And, you know, the crazy thing is it doesn't take them an awful long to, um, to, to, to adapt to this, right? We have uh, Titanobo, which is, uh, which is our kind of our showcase uh, lizard at the Florida Museum uh, from, um, from uh, Sarah Hone in Colombia, um, this, this is around in the Paleogene. So only about 5 million years after the Cretaceous extinction, we have the world's largest snake um, going around and, and munching on dinosaurs and things like that. Uh, this is, uh, this is, um, this is these, these um, fossils uh, are, are uh, currently, some of them are um, being studied at the Florida Museum and going to be returned to, um, to um, uh, Colombia. Well, the ones that, are, that, that we, we have here have all been gone back to Colombia, right? So these are, um, uh, you know, it's a disarticulated fossil. Um, we have uh, we have these large vertebrae, and you can see this is the size of a vertebra, and this is the size of a, a large green anaconda. Um, uh, John Block uh, is the curator uh, that um, that uh, discovered this, and we have these amazing C uh, CT scans and light scans of these 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 fossils that we can uh, use uh, to make these these casts and and, and work in these uh, educational programs. And of course. You know the thing is that we 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 don't have a full snake, right? We don't we don't have the entire length of the snake to to, to work with. So we have to use these kind of comparative data sets um, with museum samples to fill in the missing pieces to work out what's going on. And that's the really how I wanted to finish up talking about how important it is that all of the all of the talks, the, all of the um, the um, the the, um, the publications that I've mentioned today in these in the in these slides, all of these rely on natural history collections, right? These these are the resources that, uh, that that people use, and natural history collections are very diverse and they last a long time and they're used for all kinds of wonderful things. Um, but of course, the trouble is that a lot of the, the the specimens are behind the scenes. We take our specimen, put it on a jar, put it on a shelf, and it sits there uh, waiting for someone to come and use it. Of course. Um, 
if people want to look at the skeleton or, or open things up for dissections or, or even you know, slice them up in, Mexico, uh, in like a deli slicer to look at the thin sections, cereal sections, or, or clear and stained things to look at the cartilage and the, and the bones, that's destructive, right? And, and, and the whole point about museums is we're supposed to use samples without using them up. So the more important and the rarer and the, and the, and the, and the harder to get the specimen is, the less likely someone's going to let you skeletonize it or dissect it, right? So the, the most interesting um, uh, specimens are the ones with the least access, which is a kind of a conundrum, right? But using these computed tomography um, and, and digitization techniques, we can take these specimens and, and, and turn these, 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 these uh, samples into digital samples that we can dissect over and over again, right? So this is a burrowing frog from, from Africa. We can... Um, we can go in and, and zoom in on the skull, get a high resolution image of the skull barring head first. We might be interested in looking and seeing where, where the dense and the less dense areas are. We can clip through things digitally, right? So this is not damaging specimens, see where the high and low density areas are. We can do things like looking at wall thickness, so where the thick and the thin areas are, colorize that. We can look at those negative spaces, like those semicircular canals that we saw in the snakes earlier, right? So this is negative space. It's not even real, it's not even a, you know, a real structure. It's the negative space inside the skull. So that's the skeleton, but we can also soak these things in contrasting agents and uh, that show up the uh, soft tissue. And that allows us to see all kinds of other things, including things like the muscles. So we can take the skin off and look at the muscles and the blood vessels and the nervous system. And we can take all of this apart and look at them independently of one another, right? So we can see, you know, look, look at how the muscles um, develop and how, how the muscles interact with the nervous system and the blood vessels in the same area. And we can dissect this thing over and over and over again um, without damaging the actual specimen. The specimen sits on a jar, on a shelf, uh, and, and is there for the next person to work. So a single CT scan can, can produce all of this amazing information. Um, and, and, you know, and the contrast enhanced image, uh, imaging can, can produce more. So that brings us back to the overt, um, the overt project that, uh, that, that I started off with. Um, and I, I just wanted to you know, share this with you because I think it's a really useful resource for educators um, um, as well. So uh, again, all of our uh, samples are um, I'm running close on time. So I might not be able to show you the exact um, workings of it, but maybe we can go into it in the, in the Q and A. Um, but we're, we're, we're well on the way of digitizing all genera of amphibians and reptiles. We're nearly there with that. And, and fish, actually, we have more fish digitized than anything else, but there's just more fish than there's, there's, there's lots and lots of fish around. Um, birds and mammals we're working on. And we put this up on this, on this website, Morphosource, um, that uh, allows us to, um, to share this with you. So if you, if you make an account on Morphosource, you can go and freely download um, all of our data um, and, and 3D print it or use it in, um, in, in 3D software viewers, 3D software viewers, or you can even go in and take measurements and things on the website. We, I'm running out of time, so I won't do that. But, but ultimately, I've got, I, think, I think this digitization process is the next step um, to, uh, along the, the journey of museums, where you went from um, these cabinets of curiosities that were locked away and only, you know, only uh, owned by you know, a certain number of people to the public museums. And finally, we're getting these, these collections, the collections themselves out to the public um, digitally. And I think that, that helps us, uh, helps us um, you know, justify our existence in the world as well. Um, you know, and, that, and that's um, reflected in a lot of the uses of the data that we, that we have. So the overt generated data has been downloaded um, uh, and viewed over a million times online and downloaded 50,000 times. Um, and, and a full quarter of that is for education. Um, you know, um, you know, still lots of research being done on it, lots of personal things. I'm not sure what that means, but, but, but you know, people just interested in, 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 the, in, the, in the collections, which is great. You know, we use them for museum exhibits all the time um, and, and digital exhibits and, and, and in, in life exhibits. They're excellent for public engagement and outreach, especially 3D printing is wonderful because you can take the specimens out of the field and hand things to people. Um, and then of course we have um, education and I don't need to tell you all um, how important that is uh, and, and, and how much this can benefit, but I'd be happy to talk more about this in the, um, in the, in the Q&A session. Uh, so we have, um, we have a, a symposium every year um, uh, and a training event every year um, where we bring uh, teachers in from over the, all over the country uh, and help them develop classes using our, uh, using our data. Um, we have a lot of um, classes up on uh, the CUBES um, website. 
uh, we have uh, Sketchfab accounts. If you go on sketchfab.com, you can see our um, all of our um, a lot of our uh, processed and annotated uh, figures up there, including things like uh, these. Um, sorry, excuse me. All these um, these amazing blow apart um, skulls of, uh, of, of uh, frogs and things. And we have these great, um, I think this is called from chimpanzee, no, from A to chimpanzee. Uh, this is a, a wheel of homology where we've color coded all of the limbs, uh, relative limb bones uh, of vertebrates. Um, so you can go through and see the, uh, you know, the development of, 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 the, of, the, of the tetrapod um, falling here. So we even have tiktalic and things in there. So. Um, finally, um, we're also uh, really getting into uh, uh, at home in, uh, education uh, services. So, so we're building these cool VR interactives where you can go in and actually physically pick up the specimen. Because the one thing that you don't see on a screen is a sense of scale. So VR is, 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 is another thing that we can, we can do. So I'm close to being out of time. So I will thank you for your attention and um, I, I'll stick around for the, the Q&A session afterwards if that's okay. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Stanley. I, um, I cannot tell you how much fun it is to play on the Overt page. If you did not notice, we uh, put the links to both MorphoSource and Overt into the chat. I have spent many, many hours playing in all of his fossil um, pieces and my favorite is definitely the homology wheel. It is a beautiful piece of artistry. So um, um, we will come back to Dr. Stanley um, very soon. We're gonna ask Dr. Stanley to um, turn off his projection and then I will pull up um, our piece and introduce um, the NCSE team to everybody. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I hope you enjoyed Dr. Stanley's talk. He is very fun to listen to. And um, we had the honor of getting to spend a whole evening with him and his stories never uh, start to um, fail. I loved spending time getting to hear all of his adventures and, and things like that. So, um, but we wanted to also showcase that um, through Dr. Stanley and through several other layers of connections, we have built this beautiful lesson um, with the help of an amazing teacher named Rebecca Brewer. And we wanted to really introduce you to that tonight and kind of give you an idea of what NCSC has been up to. So for those of you who don't or have not heard of us um, in the last 40 years, um, the NCSC team has been around since Dr. Eugenie Scott got together with a bunch of other scientist minded um, people and wanted to make sure that science education was staying sound um, throughout the United States. And she led the charge through many, many different court cases and Eventually, we got to move into a new era of actually doing outreach for teachers, and that's where I come into the story. So my name is Lynn Andrews, and I am the Director of Teacher Support at the National Center for Science Education. And over the past year, I have built this amazing team that you see on the screen. Um, we are very excited that we have these wonderful teachers all over the U.S. that have volunteered their valuable time to put together lessons with us. And tonight, the one we're featuring is probably um, in my top five favorites. So um, we wanted to kind of preface this with just a few like, well, why is this lesson important to me? And why should I be teaching this in the classroom? And so the first thing we wanted to, to remind you of is that even though we've made amazing progress in the past few years, as of 2019, we still have 33% of teachers that aren't teaching evolution as settled science. And so that can be an alarming number to any of us who are biologists by, um, you know, like biology is our world, which is mine. I was a biologist before I was a teacher. But the good news is, is that um, we have been looking at the trends. And if you evaluate 2007 to 2019, we've made a lot of great progress. Um, our numbers of creationism being taught in the classroom has greatly decreased. Mixed messages are, um, more than half than what they were. And evolution as a settled science has increased significantly. So we're very proud of that work. And um, I did want to just uh, give a plug out to um, NABT and the American biology teacher, our new piece about middle school um, 
and how they ref how they're reflected is going is in the current February 2022 issue. So definitely check that out. And if I'm not mistaken, February 2022 is always free uh, because it's always the evolution issue. And if I have that wrong, I'm sure Jackie will correct me. Um, we also wanted to make sure that you guys were able to access our lesson, which is not even online yet. It is still in beta mode, but it will be going online very, very soon. We plan to have it up in March, but we've already loaded the folder for you so you can get access to all of the amazing resources that Rebecca has to share with you tonight. And if you are curious, we also have lessons in nature science and climate at um, climate change education as well. So feel free to QR code this. Um, we will also be sharing those links in the chat. Um, the NCSE team will be taking care of that as we go through. So if you are like, oh, I didn't get it, um, don't worry, we will post it multiple times. So the last thing I wanted to show you is just that when we talk about NCSE, we have three major areas. And I mentioned supporting teachers. That's what we're doing here tonight is we're trying to support you and make sure you have valuable resources. But I also wanted you to know that we are also working in areas of investigating science education. So that's where our surveys come in, like the survey piece I showed you earlier on how far we've come. And then catalyzing action, we do still vigilantly monitor all science state standards across the US and whenever there's flare ups, we will be there. Now, what makes our lessons different from things you might have encountered before is that we focus everything on this idea of a misconception based approach. And when you're looking at a misconception based approach, it's important that you understand that we're not teaching the misconceptions. We're teaching the facts and the evidence that break down and inoculate students to misconceptions. But with that, we also wanted to make sure that we had lesson flexibility in what we're doing. And so we're actually working to generate lessons for special needs, gifted, so AP level, regular bio, and actually um, special needs bio. Um, and that flexibility is important to teachers who just don't have time to put all those different differentiation pieces together. We also want every storyline we do to be engaging and unique. And so we've really put a lot of effort into these storylines having current events relative science and just like with what Dr. Stanley was talking about, this research is happening right now. So everything we do, we make sure that um, it is right in the realm of the now. Um, and so for this particular lesson, we had four major misconceptions we were targeting. And these misconceptions were generated through conversations with all of our teacher ambassadors. So we have teacher ambassadors all over the US and they have been helping us put these lessons together for the past two years. And when we went to them and said, what do you really see being the issues? These were the top four that they saw in the realm of speciation and origin of the species. And so um, those are exactly what we targeted in this lesson. And then finally, because we pride ourselves on all of our lessons being um, attached to the next generation science standards, we wanted to show you where the big pieces were for this. And um, we are doing NGSS storylining. So all of our stories build, use driving question boards and things like that. So if that hasn't got you excited enough, I am now ready to hand it over to the person who um, will really thrill you. Um, Ms. Rebecca Brewer from Michigan. Um, she's an amazing um, teacher, woman, uh, mom, you name it. Um, she's just an amazing woman. And so she has done a lot of work for us in um, both the climate change area and the evolution area. But I can definitely tell you that this is my favorite piece. Um, she is an OBTA winner um, from 2008. She also is the OBTA director from Michigan. So we we all have ties to NABT. The NABT relationship is extremely important to NCSC and, um, and um, because we know how much our teachers need support. Um, and she just got um, selected to be a new co-designer, brand new curriculum with BSCS group. So again, there's another degree of separations. We're all connected in different ways. With that, I am going to hand it over to Ms. Brewer and let her share our storyline with you. Thanks for the introduction, Lynn. And Dr. Stanley, every time I hear you talk, I get more excited about um, snakes and how much there is to learn. So when I authored this resource for um, NCSC, um, I wanted to first get kids excited about snakes. So I thought Titanoboa would be a good tie-in. 
Um, so the anchoring phenomenon that we start this resource with is called a, a Titan of a snake, where you ask your class, what was the largest snake to ever live um, or was or currently living? Um, so then from there, you'll showcase this video um, from the Smithsonian Channel. It's only about one minute long of these elementary school students who are on a playground. You can see their arms are on their shoulders and they're giving us some perspective that Titanoboa was almost 50 feet long. In the classroom, then what you would do to model 50 feet, use like ribbon or like adding machine tape um, to showcase just how long that can be. So you can see there on the right hand side, my students modeling Titanoboa. Um, next to a reticulated python, um, which so being like roughly 30 feet, um, the longest ones they found. Um, likewise, just to give some perspective to how big Titanoboa um, was, um, the green anaconda about a foot around um, today where Titanoboa almost three feet. And my students love that image because they were, were getting eaten by Titanoboa. Um, um, and, and on the last slide, Lynn, if you go back for a second, just to show that, um, from there, you'd ask, well, what questions do you now have about either Titanoboa specifically or about snake evolution? Um, and then um, organize those questions into categories and make sure the questions, of course, are open-ended questions. The students are asking no yes, no, or one word answer style questions to drive this unit and to have NGSS um, practices at the forefront, forefront of the entire unit. Next slide, please. All right, so this resource, I'm um, in designing it. There's four activities that I came up with. Um, and just like Lynn said, we're trying to, of course, use authentic um, um, data with each, with each of the four resources. In addition, we wanted to have the deep learning components um, underway, um, but also make sure it's engaging. Um, kids, you know, worksheets don't excite students. What's exciting is to actually do hands-on activities. So to make sure deep learning plus hands-on are um, compiled together. So begin by asking the class, well, we just saw elementary school children at a playground, but what evidence is there that Titanoboa was the largest snake to ever live? So have them learn about the discovery in 2004 of Titanoboa, as we can see once again, Dr. Block that um, we just saw in um, Dr. Stanley's presentation, but introducing them to where this took place in Colombia um, and why, why is it black? Why, what caused it to be black from like, and it happened in a coal mine. Um, but then tell them they're joining Dr. Black's team. Um, so they too are going to be measuring um, the vertebrae of Titanoboa compared to modern day snakes like the Burmese and the green um, anaconda to get actually to incorporate math into the resource as well as to do um, um, some, um, uh, um, some analysis there. And um, link, again, there's the pictures you can see right there, the students doing it. Yep, so they're um, using either 3D prints, as you can see, we'll see in a moment, um, either 3D prints um, that came from the MorphoSource website, or Lynn made a great set of cards for people who don't have access to 3D printers. Um, and then why? Why did Titanoboa grow so large um, as well? So what they do is they look at, you can see um, the graph there, how were temperatures different in the past that allowed for um, TBL standing for total body length. And I should give credit, we did not come up with how to do this. Um, this is from Paleo Teach, another University of Florida group. Um, we just took it and adapted it to this our, to our resource. Next slide, please. Okay, so just, once again, you can see there's the 3D print. So um, I have digital calibers, but you could even use rulers if you don't, if, you, if you're able to do 3D printing. And then, um, and of course, there's the beautiful cards that um, Lynn made to accompany this resource. All right, so part B, um, the next logical question to kind of take this forward would be, um, okay, so now that you're all excited about snakes, um, you go outside, um, there's a prompt worksheet I made, just like a one page, or you can do it as a jam board where you find a snake in a grassy field. And that picture you can see there, um, it shows the underside, the belly side of the snake, and there's two little things. And you, so that would be a, an opportunity to do a notice and wonderings of what's going on there. And I will point out that most of my students thought that those were horns. <laughs> um, so I'm like, okay, well, let's take this to the next level with, well, what's going on evolutionarily? What are those things? The little, you know, and in, 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 gonna be vestiges um, of, of limbs, but we had an artist essentially draw a bunch of different squamates into those cards there. So let's take this and see what we can look at the evolution of squamates over time. And if you'll notice with the cards, see how there's a blue outline 
um, to Najash, I believe is how you pronounce it, um, is basically being an, an extinct, or extinct squamates. And then the ones who are alive today have an orange outline around them. But we asked them to model speciation. So on my desktops, I must just use that and use the neon markers to draw evolutionary trees. So we're trying to have them connect to what are those things on, on the underside to showing limb reductionism over time. So if some students wanted to look at other features and I had to like steer them, well, like, no, we're trying to figure out what's on the bottom of the snake. So the whole, oh, these ones have like two limbs or these have four, but they're very reduced limbs and to generate not a linear relationship, but um, to show it in a tree form. Um, and then the students at a gallery walk, um, they provide peer feedback. We talk about which ones are better models um, and how can we improve upon these as a whole class discussion. And what we're working on since this resource is still in the beta form is we're trying to get um, um, access well, through, through Dr. Stanley, we can get actually skulls as well because of course scientists don't base evolutionary trees on just one piece of evidence. So we want to layer the evidence. And then from there, once they've done all that, let's have them compare their models to expert derived models by going to the one Zoom website and figuring out where some of these um, squamates fall in addition to where would you put Titanoboa within that tree. So on the next slide, should be able to see. There we go. So here's some samples of students working together and generating the phylogenetic tree. So putting the, um, the extinct organisms on lower branches and the modern day organisms on higher branches. And I pointed out to the students that this is just a hypothesis anyways. Experts are, aren't always even in agreement um, as well um, when they um, generate these, but to, 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 to put their evidence in writing why they decided to put their different branches where they placed them. Next slide, please. All right, part C. Um, in part C of, um, um, it's called, Do You Dig It? From here, we want to say, well, what, what was happening? What selective pressure, what in the environment caused them essentially to lose their limbs? And so you'd select two students from the class um, and using two Pringles cans filled with um, rice and uh, a little like toy mouse essentially buried within um, the Pringles cans. And you can see they, we, we've got those, other, I think they're called, um, what were they called? Eye puppets, I believe, are the names of those to make it look like they actually have a snake there. And then on your market set go, dig into the Pringles cans and who can get the mouse first. Um, from there, your prize is you actually get a set of limbs. And so taping, as you can see, that's my child's hand on my son. Um, but we taped um, a, a popsicle stick um, um, there and then repeat this one more time and they see that limbs would impede your ability to easily get into the burrow to retrieve prey. Um, and so discuss, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages um, to having limbs um, and from that point and, um, and recognize like why would they want to go down there in the first place to capture prey, um, to hide from um, um, predators perhaps above ground, um, what are the evolutionary benefits for thermal regulation, um, just to get all that um, to the surface. And then next the question becomes what genetic changes, oh, 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 oh we'll show the video in a second. Well, do you wanna show that now? It's fine if you prefer. Yeah, we can go, go ahead, Lynn, you can show the video. All right, so here's the video. <laughs> Oh, Lynn, there's no volume to it. Thank you for that. So that was my son actually in the video. I told him he's gonna be famous tonight. There's a lot of people re-watching him. Um, but anyways, but in class, I did it with the students as opposed to just with my child, but I wanted to make sure you guys could see what happened. But um, from there, so what genetic changes cause limb loss in snakes? 
And so um, there's a video that University of Florida made um, that, that discusses the sonic hedgehog um, gene and the role it plays. It, it, came, it really just comes down to three evolutionary changes, three changes to the gene um, involved with turning on sonic hedgehog gene. That it just flickered for a, a split second with, um, with some boas and some pythons. And that's what would cause the vestigial spurs. But for the other um, snakes, that's why they don't have limbs. So um, just to tie it to that level, you don't have to go in depth unless it's like a, a higher level class. But when writing this resource, I really was thinking like a general um, biology course. All right, next slide, please. All right, and the last and final part of this four-part storyline um, is called the Twisted Tail. And so we wanted to take it to the next level of how can we um, talk about the human influence um, on snake traits. And um, so let's put a selective breeding component within here. So how is selective breeding influencing snake traits? Um, and specifically, we focused on the morphology in terms of color variations and um, with ball pythons now. And um, ball pythons are called that because they form a little ball. And um, um, in addition, to, but they're also called royal pythons because Cleopatra apparently wore, wore one like around her arm as like jewelry. Um, so the normal color morphs have like a black coloring to them with like brown patches. And so the students essentially become snake breeders. Um, they're going, if you look there, I can show it here as well. There's different color ones where these are a breeding pair. Um, where the students will do protein synthesis, filling in um, messenger RNAs, and then, um, and then building their proteins with beads. Um, and, the, and I should point out, this is all involved with melanin production, the pathway to melanin production. Um, and so they'll compare whatever happened with their models to a, um, the wild type trait. And, all the, all, and what's interesting, this is a single gene mutation where, uh, where Almost everything today seems to be more, um, more layer, more polymorphic, but in this case, just a single gene mutation um, led to this change. And then they'll, in the end, they get to hatch out little baby snakes, as you can see there. And what I found in making these, they work better in making them like with cardstock, they get a little bit of a bounce to them. But they'll have some that have alb albinism, some that are lavender albinos, and other ones that are um, um, an ultra male, which is kind of like a caramel and caramel caramely reddish sort of coloring to them. So on the next slide, let's see that, there we go. All right, so there they are, my students modeling um, the three-step process for making babies, <laughs> baby snakes. So proud parents by the end. All right, and that's based pretty much the four parts to the resource. So feel free to ask me questions at the end. It's like I said, this is still in beta form and um, we would love for people to pilot it and to give us feedback how to make this better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, so as you can see, it's a very beautiful lesson. Um, all of these pieces, um, we have the kids uh, go back to their driving question board, look at what we answer with the next step. We also, for more advanced classes, we will have the papers available that Dr. Stanley referenced. So they can actually do some of the <clears throat> literature if they so desire. And we have many um, interactive pieces to keep that di uh, differentiation of learning going so that there's all the different kinds of um, um, ways kids can engage in the evidence. And the hope is that once they've completed this lesson, they will have broken down those four misconceptions by seeing piece after piece of that evidence built of this really beautiful story. So with that, we're going to give um, both Dr. Stanley and Rebecca some time to answer some questions. And I would like to remind you guys that you can put um, your questions into the Q&A. If you throw them into the chat, I might not catch them all, but I do have uh, a lot of people helping me um, to field questions. So be sure to send them my way um, and just let us know if you're wanting to speak with Dr. Stanley or Rebecca or both as we go. So I know, for example, this first one off the bat goes to Rebecca and I'd say just Dr. Stanley, Rebecca, why don't you turn your um, cameras back on? And it says, um, how much of protein synthesis do you introduce? Looks like plastic Easter eggs, correct? Yes, and that's my friend Renee, I noticed. <laughs> Hi, Renee. <laughs> um, so um, Renee, with this resource, um, they are given, it, it is a, from a real gene, but it's just obviously a little small segment. And we had to modify it um, simply because um, 
obviously there's 20 different amino acids. I knew most teachers wouldn't have 20 different colored beads to make their proteins. Um, so instead only five different, or six, I'm sorry, six, the color of the rainbow, only six will even show up. So they will go through protein synthesis. They will do a little mini segment. Here's your DNA, here's your mRNA, and, and translating it, of course, into the beads of the proteins and comparing it to the wild type trait. Um, so it does you know, cover it, but it's like a little mini exposure. I wouldn't put this in place of like all protein synthesis you would do um, perhaps in your classroom, but um, as an exposure piece for sure. Awesome. And our next question goes to Dr. Stanley. It says, snakes are venomous or not? Do you know which one evolved first and how would you know that? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So <clears throat> the answer, so, so what, what did, 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 so there are snakes, there are venomous snakes and non-venomous snakes, right? And, and which, uh, what's the ancestor? Is the ancestor venomous or non-venomous? It suggests that the, the, when we look at the tree, we see the, the venomous snakes, the ones that are really venomous, being nested really high up in the tree, kind of derived, um, just like snakes are very nested high up in the high up in the tree in the squamous tree. So it suggests that the ancestral snakes were probably not um, venomous, and the venom evolved um, later um, in that crown radiation. And there's three, three really three main plates of oh, radiations of venomous snakes: is the cobra, uh, the the lapids, which are the kind of the the cobras and mambas, the um, the uh, vipirids, which are the, the, the vipers and adders and rattlesnakes and things. And then there's the um, colubrids, which have a lot, of, a lot of different types of snakes in there as well. Um, and, and, and so uh, and the, and the, the snake venom is actually derived from um, uh, protein di digestive enzymes in the saliva. So, so um, there's a whole cocktail of different um, venoms that do different things. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, the I think a lot of people think that, oh, it's um, rattlesnakes, you know, uh, cytotoxic and uh, uh, elapids or the, the cobras are uh, neurotoxic, but th there's a whole host of different types of cool venom that, uh, that, that, that are mixed up. And so, uh, and, and depending on the prey that they're eating and, and the kind of the defensive capabilities they need, um, they will have different strengths and different cocktails within that. So, um, and, and, and so, and, and going back to the Helodermas, which are the venomous lizards, that seems like that's, um, uh, that's um, uh, convergent, but when the 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 tree was uh, the, the 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 tree that I showed was is derived from molecules, not from the from the um, from the um, morphological thing. So people didn't know where snakes were before we had DNA sequencing. were able to build that tree. So it was hugely surprising that things like um, uh, snakes and uh, uh, Heloderma, which are both venomous lineages, were kind of close to each other on the tree, and it made people think, well, maybe there's um, there's a group of there's a clade, you know, a group that all of those things are potentially venomous and ancestrally venomous. So um, if you take um, if you take a bearded dragon, you know, anyone has a bearded dragon, you know, dopey looking things. Um, you take a bearded dragon, you can actually concentrate up the, the the saliva and inject it into a mouse, and it has some of these toxic effects. So so the answer is. The, the genuine, like true venom probably evolved high up in the tree and the ancestor was, uh, was, was, um, was uh, um, non-venomous, but the, the, the cocktail of saliva, salivary enzymes and things probably predisposed them to do that at some point. And, and that's, that group is actually called the Toxicophora. So that's, that's you know, named after the toxic uh, saliva that they, they had there. So yeah, pretty neat. Awesome. All right, our next question is to Dr. Stanley. Do researchers think there are a few key features that once evolved in ancestors that led to greater diversification of snakes relatively quickly? So, the, yeah, so, so when we talk about, and this is like, a, I'm sure this is a, 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 a lesson that, that, that maybe AP biology, or I don't know how far along this goes, but the idea of these adaptive radiations and key innovations, um, the, the key innovations are, 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 are features that things have that give them an edge over their competition, right? Um, and, and so in this case, I would argue that probably snakes, the key innovation of snakes, it wasn't a key innovation necessarily, it was, it was an open habit. So there's, there's lots of reasons, right? That you could have a climatic change that, that makes one group of animals much, much more um, you know, evolutionarily fit 
than another, or um, or it might be that an adaptation that was maladaptive before was now was now has a positive effect, right? So so the I don't know if the limbusness the the snakes succeeded and, and, and diversified despite being basically a head with a tube on the back of it, right? It's a stupid, it's a weird way to, to live, being a head with a tube. All of the adaptations, the crazy stuff that snakes do, basically is them trying to like get around the fact that they, they don't have, right? The, the ability to break their head apart and swallow large prey. They can't, they can't, um, they can't, you know, chew, you know, they can't hold things and tear chunks off. So they have to do that. You know, the, the fangs and the venom, they can't hold on to things and, and, and oh, I guess they can, right? They, they do the constriction thing, but you know, that's another adaptation to being a limbless thing. So, so I would say that they, you know, the, 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 the snaky body isn't necessarily a super, I mean, it allows them to do things that other animals wouldn't, but it's, it's not necessarily, um, it's such a specialized trait that without that big extinction event, they'd just be, you know, borrowing all the time and just be like any of these other limbless borrowing lizards. So, um, yeah, the, the, the kind of the, the, the key innovation thing is an interesting one with snakes. I mean, they have a lot of cool stuff, but uh, I think a lot of the weirdness is, is trying to move away from the fact that they're these secondarily uh, uh, generalists. Okay, so um, another question that came up is, what is a typical advantage gained from losing legs for a snake? Well, I think you can fit in a Pringles can easier. I think that's what we're <laughs> that was the that was the kind of the takeaway. No, I mean it's exactly that, right? It's if you're if you're going through a, a viscous medium, whether it's water or uh, or soil or sand or any of these things, you tend to you tend to be more streamlined and easier easier to move if you're uh, if you're um, uh, eating, uh, you know, if you're if you're if you're limbless. Um, then you see that again. It's about limblessness has evolved dozens of times in squamates and in, in, in snakes and lizards. Well, it's only evolved once in snakes, but it's evolved a ton of times in lizards. Um, and that's all to do with it's all tied to moving through some medium that that limbs would restrict you. Awesome. So then um, I was going to field one for Rebecca since it's more tied to like how do we get these resources. Um, and um, it says, are the links available as a list of links in an email once done tonight? Um, and so, yes, we will make sure, um, Jackie has already told us that we will be able to share out links, folders, and power um, slideshows with everyone. So those will um, be available. And I believe, and I'm speaking here for Jackie, that we'll have access to that email list to send them to you. Um, and she can correct me if I'm wrong. So don't worry about that at all. And then, so back to uh, Dr. Stanley, if the ancestor of snakes was already very specialized and it is rare for an animal that specialized to radiate into so many species, what influenced that large diversification of new species over time? The variety of niches available, several factors, question mark. Well, yes, and that's, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, we don't know, right? I mean, the, the point is, we we have to kind of work out. We have to use what we what we know about the the, the current makeup of snake diversity and fossils and the tree to try and to try to piece this all together. But the story that I'm telling that that seems to fit the fit the facts that we have them as today um, is that is that that yes, it, it seemed to radiate in directly after the the extinction of level the the mass extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous, right, where there was an awful lot of competition that they would have been facing wiped out and, and cleared out. They happened to, you know, it seems like the, 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 the ones that made it across the, uh, across the, 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 the KP boundary, the, the Cretaceous uh, Paleogene boundary, um, seem to be preferentially subterranean, eating things like termites and small insects that probably would have been able to survive on, you know, a lot of the downed wood material that would have fallen over when the atmosphere caught on fire and um and so you know it would have not been a great time to to be a, an above ground uh, animal um or an animal that had a high meta metabolic rate that that would would you know wouldn't be able to survive you know five ten fifty years of, of very very little food but being a you know termite specialist or being a kind of small small lizard insect specialist that, that, that didn't require an awful lot of um, food. So, so they, they outlasted the thing. And then when things started coming back up, they were basically ready to go and, and could jump off from there. So I think that was, that's, the, that's the, my take on it. 
um, and, and other people's take on it as well. Just trust me. That's 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 the way I think that the story the story um, seems to fit. You know, it's 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 just that they made it through and they they came across a beautiful open land full of opportunities for them, and, and uh, you know where they would be it would be out competed by you know other lots and lots of other things. Those other things weren't there, and so they were able to do a lot of really cool stuff, like become Titanoboa. Okay, and then jumping back to the venomous question, um, we wanted a clarification on the difference between venomous and just poisonous. So the question being, venomous is an enzymatic enzyme and that is different from poisonous because of the enzymatic enzymes from saliva, trying to confirm the difference. If you bite it and you die, it's poisonous. If it bites you and you die, it's venomous. So venomous is injected, right? And, and poisonous is consumed. So, so actually you can, you can eat um, you can eat venom um, because if venom is salivary enzymes, right? So venom has to get into your blood system. If you swallowed venom, it would get digested in your in your acid, and it's you know, and it would not damage you. If you have cuts on your mouth, in fact, I once consulted on an episode of uh, uh, Elementary where someone was trying to poison someone with steak venom, and I said, well. You're going to have to, and anyway, they had to, they had to invent some kind of uh, carbon fiberglass thing that they, they scratch the inside of the mouth and get the venom in. So the venom has to have a system, system delivery. And that actually happened. I looked it up the other day. I was like, you know what happened to that? They actually did put that in the, in the show. Um, but um, yeah, so the venom has to get into your system and then it can cause like psych, psych can cause your um, necrosis uh, or, or it can, if it gets into your bloodstream, it can cause uh, or, or nervous system, it can cause all kinds of problems. But but if you eat it and you die, it's poisonous. If it if if it bites you and you die, then it's uh, it's uh, uh, venomous. I would prefer neither. So I'm going well, to stick with that. Yes. And there are poisonous snakes as well. There are poisonous snakes that get their poison from eating toads and newts. Newts, I think. Right. Like. Yeah. Yeah. They're some of my favorites. We call them toad poppers in the south. Ah yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so our next question is, Dr. Stanley, you showed some photos of limbless lizards. How do you know that they are more closely related to limbed lizards and are not just another form of lim limbless snakes? Yes, what a great question. Well, I mean, that's that's true. So I've got lots of books on my shelf back here. Well, I've not seen my shelf back here. I've got lots of books on my shelf when people were doing purely morphological analyses um, uh, of, of, of how, how um, lizards and snakes, you know, evolved and the relationships with them. And it does, you know, when, when you're looking at just the pure morphology, oftentimes you'll see that, um, you'll see that, that the, the, the long skinny things all tend to cluster together, right? Because when you become a, a tenuous, when you become long, you often lose the same kind of bones and do the other things. But um, if you look at, if you look at a, those, those legless geckos, for example, so, so people say, well, if it's, if it's, if it's a, you can tell it's a legless lizard because it, if it has eyelids, it's a legless lizard, right? Snakes don't have eyelids. A lot of legless lizards have eyelids. So if it has eyelids, it's a legless lizard. But of course there's legless geckos that don't have eyelids either. And if you look, and this is one of the things I was excited about sharing uh, on, the, on the cards. If you look at the skulls of those things, if you look at the skulls of the lizards, um, they look really lizardy. And snake skulls are just weird. I mean, snakes are just so weird overall i got like a picture of a snake somewhere swallowing a yeah so this this guy here is a snake that's swallowing a toad right so the, you see a snake is is actually um is actually um uh is a very reduced skull so they've lost a lot of the lost a lot of the skull architecture that allows them to do this cranial kinesis and so so if you look at under the skin internal anatomy you'll see that a lot of these lizards are very lizardy they just look snaky because they you know the external surface is tubular so they can burrow or swim or what have you. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a combination uh, and the molecular evidence backs that up, right? So if you look at the morphological evidence, a lot of it suggests that, you know, these things are convergent. If you look at the molecular evidence, you'll see that, you know, legless geckos are closely related to geckos, legless skinks are embedded inside skinks, legless uh, angwid lizards are embedded inside angwid. So they all, they all fit together. So, and that's, and that's separate from the morphology. So the, the molecules, the molecules are, are less confusing in a lot of cases. But yes, it's, it, yeah, it is, it's confused people for a long time. Well, and then um, I'll field one more question that's tied to um, the, the Q&A box. So the actual name of our lesson is A Snake in the Grass, um, and that was Rebecca's um, title. 
we wanted to give a nod out to the great Charles Darwin who we're ce celebrating tonight. So we, we called it the origin of a species, meaning as a reference to the snake story. Um, so all the snake species. So it isn't specifically one, it is the multitude of from limbed to limb, limblessness is the main part of the story. But the actual title of the lesson that Rebecca came up with was A Snake in the Grass. And we wanted to just add a little bit more to it to give it some speciation. All right, are there any other questions? Oh, I'm, I'm sharing a, uh, uh, the, the, the link to the true facts about the lizard tongues, uh, which again, everybody, okay. should, everybody should watch at some point in their life. It's, uh, uh, it's amazing. And the, and the guy who does this, he does great, great videos. Uh, he, he, um, he has these, uh, has these videos on, on all kinds of things. And he works with the scientists who, 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 who do this research as well. So it's, 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 it's legitimately sourced. Uh, I encourage you all to uh, get into it. You have gotten some uh, shout outs, Dr. Stanley. You've got some new fans, so you should be aware of that. Um, lots of. Uh, I'm always happy to talk to classes remotely as well. Uh, it's easier to talk remotely these days, but if you're interested in, in having having someone like me come by and, and chit chat with your class, I'm, I'm, I'm up for that. So do drop me an email or a, or a tweet or something. That's don't say those things if you don't mean them because teachers oh, will take it. you up on it. Okay. I love it. So it's super fun. Awesome. And so um, I did want to let you know that uh, Rebecca can answer any questions about the lesson plans you might have. Um, she put we put her contact information up earlier. We will also include that in the links with everything else. Um, the entire NCSC teacher support team can also assist. We also have tons of teacher ambassadors that are available in your areas. If you have any questions, we can connect you to the right ones. And Dr. Stanley's information will be um, there as well. And with that, I think it's time to pass it back to our new president. Um, Chris, Chris, are you available? I, I am available. Thank you, Lynn. Um, again, I just want to thank our panelists, Dr. Stanley. Um, amazing job, as always. Uh, Rebecca and Lynn, again, appreciate all of your hard work. Um, I'd like to thank NCSE for coordinating the session without them. Um, I don't know if this would have been possible. Thank you to all the attendees and reminder that this recording will be posted on the NABT YouTube channel. And finally, I just want to wish everybody a great night and a happy Darwin day. And um, that's it. So uh, this is uh, great seeing all of you tonight and uh, have a good weekend. <laughs>